It is a very great honor to welcome Masha Gessen to the Academy today. Masha is a journalist who writes regularly for English and Russian language press and possibly others, from my own. I won't call her fearless because, as she frequently says, you have to be stupid to be fearless. But she is very brave and does not mince words, and as far as I can tell, does not self-censor for her audience or herself. Not surprisingly, her writings have landed her in trouble more than once. She's an activist for many causes, the best known of which in this country are scathing criticism of the Putin regime and her advocacy for LGBT rights. The latter topic has sort of become mainstream in most parts of the US, but is quite recently relevant in the Naval Academy, so we definitely appreciate her work in that sphere as well. Masha is the author of many books and has won many prizes. She's written a riveting book about Vladimir Putin, The Man Without a Face, we all know his face now, which only covers his first two terms, but is no less relevant for that. Her subsequent books include The Brothers, about the Boston Marathon bombers, and Words Will Break Cement, about the arrest and trial of Pussy Riot. Most recently, she has written on the Soviet project to create a Jewish homeland within the Soviet Union, Vira Vaidan, and the title of this book, Where the Jews Aren't, gives a hint of how successful that project was. This book came out really three weeks ago or something. Yeah. 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 Um, so, very nice. Um, and here it is. All of Masha's writing is characterized by wit, intelligence, and sharp insight. I would characterize her books as investigative journalism and scholarly journalism, um, because she traces the events she's describing to their sources, traveling across the world to put together her story. For example, the remarkable part of her book on the Tsarnaev brothers was interviewing the family members in Dagestan, and recreation of the experience of the family's move to the United States from the point of view of not entirely welcome immigrants. Uh, she researches all her subjects thoroughly and is not averse to consulting scholars and academics, which rather distinguishes her from fellow journalists, at least in this country. If there is anyone qualified to talk about why Putin is scary, it is Masha Gessin. Her experiences in Russia since she moved back to Moscow in 1991 have prompted her and her family to leave Russia once again and come back to the States. In 2012, she wrote at the end of her Man Without a Face, um, a, she describes how Putin had become a kind of a bogeyman whose name struck terror in small children. And if I'm remembering this correctly, she was comforting her frightened son, uh, saying, don't worry, he's just a man, meaning he isn't a supervillain, he doesn't have superpowers, and most important, he cannot live forever, right? <coughs> so with that, I'll turn the floor to Masha Gessin, who can tell us the real reasons Putin is scary right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a great... What a great introduction, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Do I need the mic? Yeah? Could you please, uh, please use the mic? Please use the mic, okay. All right, is this better? Okay. So I have half an hour to tell you why Putin is scary. <laughs> uh, I'll try. Um, I want to return you uh, mentally to ancient history, uh, September 19, uh, 2013. Uh, this was soon after President Obama said that there was going to be a red line in Syria, that if the Assad regime used chemical weapons, then the US was going to interfere, and then he couldn't get congressional support for that, and Putin came in to save the day and said that he was going to uh, negotiate chemical disarmament in Syria. Uh, and basically, he helped Obama save face. Uh, what he actually did was he hijacked the issue of Syria at the time. It was his absolute triumph in terms of foreign policy. He'd been working toward this day for the 13 years that he'd been in power, or almost 14 actually at that time. Uh, he even published an op-ed in the New York Times in which he called out the United States for exceptionalism and for ignoring international law. Six months after that, Russia annexed Crimea and invaded eastern Ukraine. Uh, and the way the annexation went down uh, you would be forgiven for not remembering or even not following it at the time. It was all rather confusing. Ukraine had had a revolution. There were mass protests 
with literally hundreds of thousands, maybe over a million people in the streets. The parliament finally, after months of unrest, sided with the people and impeached the president. The president, the absolutely corrupt president of Ukraine, fled to Russia. And um, Russia, uh, uh, two weeks later, announced that, uh, there, uh, that there was going to be a referendum in Crimea asking Crimeans whether they wanted to be a part of Russia. Now Crimea is uh, a peninsula of about uh, a million people, a little bit more than a million people, most of whom are Russian speakers and ethnic Russians, not all of them, but most of, most of them are and many of whom are Russian identified. But they didn't matter very much at the time of the referendum. The way that the referendum went down was that first of all, it was organized in two weeks. Second of all, uh, the billboards that went up all over Crimea uh, had two images of them. On the left, there was a map of Ukraine with an American flag superimposed on it and barbed wire superimposed on that. And on the right, there was a map of, uh, not of Ukraine, of, of Crimea. And on the right, there was a map of Crimea with the Russian flag superimposed on it. And it said, we're choosing between this and that. The choice was obvious to Crimeans. Uh, it was made all the more obvious by the fact that uh, the, the, a couple of weeks before the referendum, strange people in green uniforms began flooding Fr Crimea. They weren't, um, you know, it wasn't an armed invasion exactly, except that it was an invasion and these people were armed, <laughs> but, uh, but there, was, there was no gunfire, uh, they just appeared. They were, as Putin himself said, polite, and ever since then, it's been known as the, as the polite men or the polite green men because they were wearing unmarked green uniforms. And they were everywhere. And we think they were Russian. Well, actually, Putin eventually, a couple of months later, uh, admitted that they were Russian. In addition, the Russian parliament authorized the use of force abroad and specifically in Crimea two weeks before the referendum. So, um, uh, you know, obviously all the conditions were in place for the people of Crimea to make their free choice, and they voted, 96% of them voted to join the Russian Federation. And Vladimir Putin addressed, uh, he, he assembled the entire par uh, Russian parliament in the Kremlin, along with a bunch of governors and some guests of honor. It was an unprecedented gathering of people. And he gave a speech in which he talked about how uh, Russia was called upon to defend Russians abroad. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that the revolution in Ukraine threatened uh, the, Rus uh, the ethnic Russians of Crimea who asked Russia for help and Russia had to intervene. I, I just want to put this into context for you because maybe it sounds kind of neutral, kind of reasonable, to talk about Russians abroad uh, or, uh, or to talk about the, uh, Russia's duty to protect Russian speakers abroad. This kind of rhetoric has a history. It has a very specific history. Uh, about 75 years before the annexation of Crimea, there was the German annexation of a part of Czechoslovakia uh, called Sudetenland. And the way it was carried out was that first there was a weird kind of invasion, and then there was a referendum, and then Hitler said, we were called upon to protect our countrymen abroad. Uh, and the, uh, the overlap between Putin's Crimea speech and, Putin's, uh, and Hitler's Sudetenland speech is amazing. It is absolutely remarkable. It was the exact same rhetoric, the exact same argumentation. Uh, and then after the, after the annexation of Crimea and after Russia went into Ukraine, uh, where it's still fighting a war, 
uh, the United States and Western Europe, uh, first the United States, then, was, uh, then uh, the European Union, imposed economic sanctions on Russia. Uh, there are a couple of different kinds of sanctions. They're basically strategic uh, uh, imports and dual use import, uh, or exports to Russia are forbidden. And a number of Russian officials who are uh, on a list of people who are believed to have either been implicated in gross violations of human rights or to be direct, directly implicated in Russia's policies toward Ukraine when, uh, are sanctioned financially and they're, uh, you know, they're, basic, they're, they're basically persona non grata in the European Union and in the United States. Russia responded by imposing its own sanctions, what it calls counter sanctions, uh, which banned imports into Russia of a lot more things than, the, than Europe banned exporting to Russia. Uh, Russia banned importing uh, cheese uh, and meat products and basically uh, almost any kind of uh, food products from Euro the European Union, the United States, Australia, and a couple of other countries. The, all the same countries that, uh, that had imposed sanctions on Russia. The, these counter sanctions dealt a much bigger blow to the Russian economy than the American and European sanctions did, which may sound kind of weird uh, and, and, and counterintuitive. Why would Putin have done something like that? It actually makes perfect sense because um, for, uh, for a country that's sort of being mobilized, for a country that's called upon to sacrifice, and also for a country that needs to be whipped up into a fervor about uh, being at war, hardship is actually not a bad thing, economic hardship. Uh, economic hardship and, and suffering and feeling like you are in a different state now, you're in a state of war, life has changed. Those things are very, very useful to, for mobilizing a population. So whether it was strategic or whether it was instinctive, uh, Putin did something that was very productive in terms of whipping up the population into fervor. And indeed, after the annexation of Crimea, his popularity went through the roof. It reached almost 90%. And it has stayed up there since. It's, uh, the, according to the latest polls, it's about 82%. Now, you probably realize that in no democratic country, no leader, no matter how popular, can possibly have an 82% approval rating. Right? This is a different kind of animal. These are sort of totalitarian level numbers. And I think it's probably even not even particularly useful to think about them as public opinion uh, polls. The, the, they're sort of measuring the level of totalitarianism in society, and that level is pretty high. In any case, uh, by, uh, by, by the year 2015, Russia was a very different country than it had been. Uh, back in Putin's days of glory, remember when he hijacked Syria in September 2013, Russia had become an international pariah. Russia had been kept out of a number of international meetings. Uh, you know, Putin had trouble getting his hand shaken uh, at international meetings, uh, or he had no one to take pictures with. Uh, and, um, and of course, Russia was, uh, you know, after a number of years of unprecedented prosperity, you know, a number of years when uh, Russia was the world's largest market for luxury cars and other luxury goods. Uh, Russia was experiencing real economic hardship. And I think Putin couldn't quite figure out how he got there. Because all he did was basically two things to get him on the world's bad list. One was uh, have a, a launch an anti-gay campaign which preceded the uh, invasion of Ukraine. And the second thing, much, much bigger on the world stage, was in the invasion of Ukraine, which also involved the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner, if you, uh, as you recall. Uh, and, um, and still, uh, I think it was unexpected to him that he found himself an international pariah. So he came up with a brilliant plan for fixing this. And on the 17th anniversary of the United Nations, he went to New York and addressed the General Assembly. It was the first time in 10 years that he had attended the General Assembly of the United Nations. He gave this impassioned speech 
in which, among other things, he said that the United Nations was actually uh, conceived in Yalta uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the Yalta conference that, uh, at which part of the negotiations uh, ending World War II had occurred. It's not exactly true. There, uh, the United Nations was not born in Yalta. There's some relationship to Yalta. Uh, and, uh, and then he, he, he proposed an anti-ISIS coalition in which the United States and Russia would cooperate against ISIS uh, like the anti-Hitler coalition. The implication of that proposal was very clear because the anti-Hitler coalition um, it, during World War II was something that, uh, that uh, was very good for the Soviet Union in many ways. One was it was sort of, uh, it granted the Soviet Union total forgiveness for everything that had happened before World War II or even at the beginning of World War II. At the end of the war, the Soviet Union was allowed to keep everything it had annexed under the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Do people know what the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is? Uh, probably not. Uh, it was, it was the Nazi Hitler Pact, uh, or the Nazi Soviet Pact that was signed in 1939 that allowed uh, the Soviet Union to annex parts of Poland, parts, parts of Romania, and all of the Baltic countries. Uh, uh, and Hitler to take the other half of Poland. And it was a non-aggression pact. So after Hitler violated the non-aggression pact and invaded the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union uh, became, became allies uh, with the United States and Great Britain and France, uh, well, the, the resistance government of France. So after the war, it was, the Soviet Union was allowed to forget and to hide the disgraceful history of the Nazi-Soviet pact. Not only that, but also to keep everything it had annexed under the Nazi-Soviet pact, and also to expand its sphere of influence to Eastern Europe, to essentially colonize Eastern Europe until 1989. Uh, and it also established, you know, the, 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 uh, the anti-Hitler coalition established the Soviet Union as a superpower after World War II. So that's what Putin was basically saying. I want to be a superpower again. I also want to write off all my sins. So you stop criticizing me for the crackdown. You stop criticizing me uh, for Ukraine. You let me have Ukraine, and you let me have whatever else I want in what used to be the Soviet sphere of influence in exchange for entering into a glorious equal partnership in fighting ISIS. Uh, I think he actually expected that this would be a welcome proposal. And I think he was actually surprised that it wasn't accepted. Not only was he surprised, he was pissed. And a week later, Russia began bombing Syria. And it has uh, you know, claiming all along that it was bombing ISIS. Although, uh, as became clear very soon, and as has become tragically clear in the last few weeks, it's actually targeting civilians and rebel strongholds, not ISIS strongholds. And another reason, of course, that Putin is, uh, uh, is so involved in Syria is that he identifies with uh, Bashar al-Assad. He sees Assad as the only legitimate leader of Syria, that's what he has said many times over that Assad is, but he also sees Assad as the, the same kind of legitimate leader of Syria as Putin is a legitimate leader of Russia. And so if the United States can remove Assad, what is to stop the United States from removing Putin at some point? That's his thinking. So he absolutely needs to, re to, uh, to, to prevent an American success in Syria uh, or a rebel success in Syria at all cost. A couple of weeks after Russia began bombing Syria, uh, Putin assembled uh, what's, what he calls the Valdai Club. It's a club of, uh, well, it's a gathering of international Russia experts, which has been going for over a decade now, ever since Putin realized that he needed to sort of burnish his reputation abroad. Uh, so all of these people basically come to a junket in Russia 
uh, all expenses paid, uh, and they get to sit down with Putin, uh, you know, have dinner with Putin, uh, ask Putin questions. It's, it's completely unparalleled access. No one who is not invited to Valdai ever enjoys this kind of access to Putin. Uh, and a lot of Western academics, uh, a lot of American academics uh, uh, take this opportunity because it gives them access to Putin, even though it's become more and more sort of morally problematic to accept this kind of invitation. So he had a, a gathering in the Valdai Club in October 2015, and the topic was uh, war and peace. And Putin, he gave a speech, and he basically said that peace is an unnatural state of, of affairs. That for most of its history, humanity has been at war, well, which is true. Uh, and, um, and that war will continue forever. Now, again, uh, this is uh, uh, even more ominous because of the historical context. The idea of forever war is a very is very much a Nazi idea. This was this was when it really first sort of showed up, at least in the 20th century. This idea that it is fated that there will always be war, and in this war, some will aim to be always stronger, and uh, and preparing for forever war and knowing that there will be forever war, is sort of a mark of, of realism, a mark of strong leadership in today's world. So that was the line that Putin was adopting now. Uh, and that he, he was informing his listeners that this what it, um, what he was doing. Uh, now let's fast forward a little bit to what has happened in the last uh, few days. Uh, in the last few days, Putin, uh, well, a couple of days ago, uh, uh, Russia suddenly, unilaterally backed out of a plutonium disposal uh, agreement with the United States. The, uh, you know, the, the agreement is highly technical. Uh, actually, the United States is not exactly complying with this agreement either. Uh, and it doesn't have direct implications for Russia's nuclear capabilities. Uh, it's, uh, the agreement was for the disposal of, um, uh, of surplus weapons-grade plutonium. And the main idea behind this agreement is that it should be, uh, both countries should get rid of it to safeguard it. Not, you know, it's not disarmament per se, it's, it's safeguarding this plutonium from possibly getting into the wrong hands. So Russia's saying that it's backing out of this agreement is a weird kind of uh, rhetorical uh, threat more than it is sort of a, a real threat. But, but again, let's, let's put it into context. First of all, what, uh, uh, what, what has preceded this, uh, the backing out of this, uh, of this agreement is that ever since the invasion of Crimea, Putin has found an opportunity to remind the world that, it, uh, that Russia is a nuclear power at least once every couple of months. Sometimes it's at a, at a Russian Security Council meeting where he will say, well, and they have to, you know, they have to take us into account because we're a nuclear power. Uh, sometimes it's by, uh, you know, testing uh, weapons uh, uh, with nuclear warheads, which Russia hadn't done in decades before uh, renewing these tests in, in the summer of 2014. Uh, and so, uh, sometimes it's in, it's in other speeches. So this is this is yet another reminder that Russia will not be treated as a junior partner uh, because it's it's a nuclear power. Another thing that's really important about the way that Putin did it is the uh, is the way he explained it, and the way he explained it is by introducing a law a bill in the Russian parliament and the job of the Russian parliament is is just a rubber stamp whatever the president sends them uh, so th by introducing a bill that says that the reason for backing out of this agreement is that the United States has acted more and more hostily t toward Russia over the last several years and that the world situation has changed dramatically since the agreement was signed and negotiated. The last time it was, it was re renegotiated was, was in 2010, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, which is also no coincidence that he's backing out of it now. 
uh, and that the only reason, the only way that Russia would be willing to return to complying with the agreement is if the United States lifted sanctions and compensated Russia for, get this, not just the losses it had suffered because of the sanctions, but also the losses it has suffered because of the counter sanctions. Uh, and actually, that little bit uh, with uh, what Putin says that it, he will, uh, Russia will only comply with an agreement that it is legally bound to comply with, uh, and that is in its best interest to comply with, right? Uh, because Russia uh, has more and more troubles with maintaining internal security and the danger of the, the weapons-grade plutonium getting into uh, the wrong hands is not a theoretical danger, right? Um, but Russia is backing out of this agreement uh, unless the United States compensates it for sanctions, that's a tantrum, right? That's not, it's not, you know, it's not a strategic move. It's not even a sort of a, a small rhetorical threat or a large rhetorical threat. It's a temper tantrum. Uh, and it's completely in character for Putin, right? He is, um, I mean, when the man came to power and no one knew who he was, he was uh, plucked from complete obscurity, in part because he'd been a secret agent, so he wasn't exactly supposed to have uh, a public biography, but in part because also he hadn't done much in his life. Um, uh, he'd, uh, he'd been pl equally plucked from, uh, from obscurity to head the Russian Secret Services, uh, the Russian intelligence agency, and then, and then very soon after that, he became prime minister and was anointed uh, then President Yeltsin's successor. Uh, so no one knew who he was, and he commissioned an official biography. Uh, and he gave a series of interviews to three journalists to have that biography written. And what he mostly talked about was getting into fights, getting into fights as a kid, getting into fights as a teenager, getting into fights as a, as a grown man. And those fights always followed the same pattern, where he would get mad at somebody and lash out. And then he would calm down, and just as everybody thought it was over, he would lash out again. Which is, you know, if you think about it, it's an amazing thing for somebody to want people to know about him, especially if it's like the only thing he wants people to know about him. <laughs> that, uh, that he has troubled contro trouble controlling his temper and that he holds grudges forever. And combined with this, the way that he backed out of the plutonium agreement by throwing a temper tantrum in complete uh, in complete keeping with the way that he has described himself to the world as this vengeful man who, who has trouble controlling his temper, combined with his feeling really slighted by, uh, for, by being a pariah, unfairly so, he thinks, combined with his continuous nuclear saber rattling, I think that's, those are the reasons that he is a little bit scary. And I'll stop now and, and take questions. Thank you. You know just what I need. Who's going to be brave enough to offer the first question? And when you raise your hand, just to identify yourself. I have a uh, I mentioned in first class, Christopher Grail. Um, I am also the president of the Spectrum, which is our organization on the yard uh, that um, is in communities surrounding uh, LGBT issues. And you mentioned that one of the Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, so w when Putin first came back into, uh, into the office of president, which he didn't, you know, he, uh, um, let me give you a little bit of background. So Putin w uh, became the Russian leader in 1999. He was appointed by then President Yeltsin to be prime minister and sort of groomed to become the next president, which he promptly became in 2000. He served two terms. Uh, the Russian Constitution has a two-term uh, limit for the president, 
but Putin decided that that meant that only two terms consecutively, and then as many more terms as he wanted. So uh, he stepped aside for four years and uh, appointed his close aide, Dmitry Medvedev, to sort of sit in the president's chair for four years. He kept running the country, but symbolically Medvedev was, uh, was president. And then Putin returned to the presidency in 2012, and he's planning to serve two more terms, except that now they've been changed to six-year terms instead of four-year terms. So he's planning to be in power until uh, 2024, at least. Uh, and um, when he came back into office, he was faced with protests for the first time in, uh, since he came to power. There were mass protests in Russia. Uh, people were protesting rigged elections, uh, corruption, bad governors, governance, all sorts of things. And Putin was really scared uh, because he is terrified of, of, of protest. So he, uh, he staged a major political crackdown with arrests, with, uh, with, with much stricter laws, uh, with you know, people being threatened with exile and people being forced into exile. But one of the features of this crackdown was the anti-LGBT campaign. One of the first things he did was he sort of framed the protesters as gays, which is kind of shorthand for everything that's other, for everything that comes from the West, everything that's not inherently Russian. Uh, and it's pretty effective. I mean, scapegoating a minority is always effective. But LGBT people are a particularly good minority to scapegoat because most Russians believe that they've never met an LGBT person. So they think it's, it's, it's an abstraction. Uh, most Russians also believe that, uh, that, uh, that gay people are an import from the West, that Russians don't have their own gay people, which is a little bit true uh, in the sense that the idea of gay identity, the idea of, of LGBT rights, that all came after the Soviet Union collapsed, right? There were obviously people who had, you know, who had love relationships and sexual relationships with people of the same sex, but there wasn't uh, an LGBT movement uh, or even an understanding of LGBT identity in Russia until after the Soviet Union collapsed. So it was very easy to choose LGBT people to be the, the, the scapegoat, right, for everything that had gone wrong with Russia. Uh, and the, uh, there's been a lot of anti-gay propaganda on Russian television. On any given day, you're likely to turn on Russian television and hear about how horrible these gay people are, how they're going to come after your children, how, are they going to cons uh, how they can't reproduce for themselves, uh, which is really funny because the most visible uh, gay person in the country at the time uh, was me, and I have three children. Uh, but uh, they can't reproduce, so they're reduced to, to recruiting from straight families. That's how gay people are made, obviously. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, in, uh, in 2013, Russia passed a ban on homosexual propaganda, which is this very strange law that basically uh, makes it illegal to, uh, to, to even, and this is really interesting, to even claim that there is social equality between what they call traditional and non-traditional marital relations, right? So it makes it a, a crime to claim social equality. It actually uh, codifies second-class citizenship in law. There's another law that bans adoption by same-sex couples or people from countries where same-sex marriage is legal. Uh, there are proposed laws that would ban any outward expression of homosexuality. That would actually allow police to arrest people if they look gay. That law hasn't passed yet, but it's, it's, it's pending in the parliament. There is another pending bill that would allow uh, authorities to remove children, including biological children, from same-sex households. But you know, this, this overabundance of laws, including these bills that haven't been passed, is part of a much larger campaign to basically incite violence against LGBT people. And that's what's, what it's really all about. It's not really about prosecuting people. It's about getting people beaten up, and it's about you know, sort of mobilizing people in the streets 
to, to do their own justice, to do vigilante justice, and that's exactly what's happening to LGBT people in Russia. There have been a lot of murders uh, uh, and even more street violence, to the point where I'll give you an example. There was a cafe in Moscow, in the center of Moscow, the sort of hipster joint, that actually posted a notice on the door in the summer of 2013, anti-gay violence will not be to tolerated here. Imagine what kind of environment you have to be in uh, as, a, as, as a cafe manager to think that you have to post a notice, a written notice, telling people at a, at a, at a fashionable you know, urban cafe that they shouldn't engage in anti-gay violence. Right? So that's, that's the environment there, and that has produced a huge outflow of uh, LGBT refugees from Russia. There are at least, um, at least about 1,000 people in the New York area alone who are seeking asylum, uh, LGBT people. There are many people in Europe. There are many people in other parts of the United States. It's a scary place to be gay. More questions? That was, that was a half. <laughs> you, you need to be brave. Mr. Before class, Paramore Second Company. Um, so in America, we have you know checks and balances systems to you know check the president and check the Congress and ju ju judiciary branch. So is it that is that the same case? I guess in Russia, the, is the Parliament able to check Putin in any way, or is there any? Does he just get like total war? I guess. Thank you for asking that question. So um, the first thing that Putin did uh, after he came to power was he took over the media. <coughs> Within a year of his coming to power, so by the spring of 2001, uh, the entire, uh, all broadcast television in Russia was controlled by the state. Right? That's, most Russians get their news from TV. Broadcast television goes out to 92% of the households. So it's, it's like having a voice in the brain of every Russian, the Putin, the P Putin's voice in the brain of, of every Russian. And it's a whole generation of people who have grown up watching nothing but state television, right? This happens 15 years ago. Uh, so that's the first, the first part of the system of checks and balances gone, the free media gone in 2001. The second thing he did was he dismantled, dismantled the electoral system. So Russian governors, uh, Russia is nominally a federation, uh, much like the United States, nominally. Uh, but, uh, and Russia used to have elected governors. But in 2004, Putin canceled gubernatorial elections. He also canceled elections to the upper house of the Russian parliament, the Senate. Now the entire Senate is appointed. The lower house of parliament is still elected, uh, but for about 10 years, it was only, uh, so for two election cycles, it was elected according to party list. So people don't actually know who they're voting for. They're voting for parties. And only parties that are approved by the state can be on the ballot. So it basically had a monopoly on that as well. Now the system has been opened up a little bit. The, the elections just to the lower house of parliament, nothing else, uh, have been opened up a little bit. But it's useless because even though some opposition candidates can get on the ballot, they can't campaign because they don't have access to media because all the media is in the Kremlin's pocket. Uh, the president is nominally also still elected. But again, nobody can get on the ballot if Putin doesn't want that person on the ballot. So it looks like there are other people on the ballot, but those people are chosen by Putin. Nobody who is actually strong enough to be in competition with Putin is allowed on the ballot. And even if they were, they wouldn't be able to campaign because they wouldn't have access to media. Uh, and that leaves the courts. Uh, the courts were always very weak in Russia. I mean, Russia had only been uh, post-Soviet for 10 years, less than 10 years. Judicial reform in Russia didn't really begin until 1996. It was very slow starting, uh, partly because, uh, you know, in a, in a system that didn't, uh, had, you know, the Russians had never had a democracy. Uh, a lot of people who were trying to design political reform in Russia didn't know, didn't realize how important courts are to uh, a democratic system. 
I think that realization came later than the realization that there have to be elections because that's a much more obvious thing. So judicial reform didn't really start until 1996. And in 2000, it got reversed. So it was really easy to bring the courts under uh, the executive branch, the control of the executive branch, uh, branch as soon as Putin came to power. To give you just one indication of how the courts work in Russia, the, uh, the percentage of uh, acquittals in Russia is less than half of 1%, right? So if you get charged, you will be convicted, right? So these are not courts. And there, you know, there are regions in Russia, including central Russia, the, uh, Europe, uh, the, the, the part of Russia, part of European Russia where Moscow is, uh, that last year had zero acquittals. You know, not per zero percent, zero acquittals. Not one person was acquitted. So that, that thank you for that question. I knew they would open up after a couple yeah. of, I, I saw an arm in the back. Uh, go ahead. Good afternoon, I'm Chip Hall. I teach navigation in another part of the yard. Uh, you mentioned some of the similarities between Hitler in Nazi Germany and Putin in modern day Russia. Uh, I'm wondering if you see any significant differences, and more importantly, given those similarities and differences, what can the world community learn about dealing with a person like either of those? Right. Uh, I think the biggest difference between Hitler and Putin is that. Uh, Hitler was charismatic. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, you know, there's there's uh, uh, there's a lot of scholarship on charismatic leaders, uh, so it's not just a joke, although it's a joke too. But uh, uh, charismatic leaders are a particular kind of leader, right? Uh, we're watching one emerge, or we have watched one emerge in the United States uh, as as we speak. Um, and uh, the, the, the great sociologist Max Weber wrote about charismatic leaders and he distinguished between different kinds of, of charisma. So he, he wrote that there was a first kind which was sort of innate. It was the kind of charisma that, that Hitler had where you know, he would be absolutely mesmerizing when he talked. Putin, you know, I've spent uh, at this point you know, more than half of my career listening to every speech that Putin has ever given and uh, you know, reading everything he's ever said. And I have to tell you, it's really boring. Mesmerizing, it is not. Um, it can be funny, but, uh, but you do not have like, the experience of, 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 of being transfixed. Uh, that's what Weber called the second type of charisma, which derives from the office. The moment that Putin was placed in the presidential chair, he had charisma. <clears throat> But it wasn't his own. It came from the office that he occupied. Uh, I don't know whether that tells us anything about, about dealing with him, uh, except that the moment he loses uh, uh, the levers of power, things will shift dramatically in Russia. Because there's nothing about him personally that, that holds that kind of attention, that holds that kind of loyalty. It's the office. Uh, I, you know, we can't say that the world was particularly good at dealing with Hitler. Uh, it would really be tragic if Putin lost power by, you know, by losing a world war. Let's hope it happens some other way. On that note, let's thank uh, Ms. Gessen for her time. present her with an, an ubiquitous uh, image of her lecture with Vladimir Putin <laughs> on a famous czar era uh, painting with uh, uh, a, a computer terminal next to it so he's hacking our campaign. So this is great. Well, thank you for <laughs> this is And it's your honorary. Oh, thank you. This is my absolute favorite poster ever. <laughs> oh, thank you. Go Navy.